speakers. And, um, I'll send it to you, David. Well, good afternoon to everybody. How's everybody doing? It's been a fun day so far. Thumbs up, big thumbs up. Now, one of the things we're going to ask you to do, well, first of all, again, my name is David Bugs. I'm the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for Texas Parks and Wildlife, yay, Texas. Uh, and I'm also the Vice Chair for the Diversity and Inclusion Working Group. I do whatever Jen tells me to do, basically. That's how that goes. So I'm very excited to be here today, but I'm more excited about uh, this dynamic group of folks that are going to share with you this afternoon. So I'm going to ask you to do a couple of things. If you have not, uh, other than our speakers, will you go ahead and mute, put yourselves on mute, also, uh, we need to uh, shut down your videos, because I think if you shut down your videos, then it'll amplify the, the folks that are, that are going to be speaking. Can we make them larger, uh, Jen or, or Kelly? We can, um, on your video settings, if you, if everybody, where you have the video option at the bottom, if you click on the little carrot, the little arrow up, and then you click on video settings, there's an option under meetings that's hide non-video participants. And if you click on that, it will hide the folks who don't have their video on. So we can all turn our videos off and then hide the uh, non-video participants. And then we'll just see those with their video on. Fantastic. So if everybody would go ahead and do that. I know uh, if you're like me, you're a little technology challenged but uh, we are going to make this work. So thank you again for joining us this afternoon. Again, I'm very excited about the sessions we're gonna do. Uh, just a little uh, information about it. Jen and I have been talking about uh, how do we get information in front of the folks uh, from people that are different from the traditional folks we have come and speak to us. Uh, one of the things that I know conservation agencies wrestle with is uh, their relevance to this fast growing and hugely diverse population that uh, we're trying to serve. And we've got to be aware of how others are introduced to nature, how they interact. Uh, and, and it may not be the same way that we traditional, what we call traditional conservation to interact. We all have the same level of respect and intrinsic appreciation for the outdoors, but our stories of engagement are a little different. And, and the danger we run into, the danger we face is when we're trying to engage our growing population in traditional conversations around conservation and make a lot of assumptions about what those real barriers are to the outdoors. So what we thought would be great uh, is how can we get folks in front of uh, our traditional audience to talk about their experience? So what, today, what we did today was uh, we invited uh, three people uh, to come and speak with us, uh, three people who have a passion for wild things and wild places. I've heard that a lot in my agency. And they focus their careers and their livelihoods on natural resource conservation. And they're going to share their story. So, a uh, real quick introduction, and I'm going to get out of the way. Our, our panelists uh, consist of Deja Perkins, Jason Ward, and Kevin Melanson. Uh, a little bit about Deja. Deja is a wildlife fisheries and conservation biologist, biology graduate student at North Carolina State University. She is studying the overlap between bird diversity and distribution in urban areas with human, socioeconomic, and cultural distribution. Is that right? Did I say all of that right, Deja? And I think you're on mute. You all are on mute right now. So you can take yourselves off of mute. Yes, you got that right. Also, also Deja is uh, she's originally from Chicago, but she's also a former C4 Minrick student. So I'm very excited about that. I met Deja when she was an undergrad a few years ago. And I think this fall you're receiving your PhD. Am I right? <clears throat> Not yet. So I decided to take a break and get a little bit of experience. Um, in the field working, and then I'll go back to get my PhD. Oh, fantastic. So I'm very excited about Deja being here. I, I feel like a, a, a gloating dad just a little bit. Uh, the next person we have is Mr. Jason Ward. Jason is an American naturalist, birder, and activist. He is the host of the 2019 television documentary series, Birds of North America. 
Some of you all may have seen that. Jason is also the founder and CEO of Black AF in STEM Collective. Jason is from the Bronx, New York. He is currently living in Georgia where he leads bird walks and has done science surveys for the Atlanta Audubon Society. Welcome, Jason. Thank you so much for having me, it's a pleasure. And last but certainly not least is Mr. Kevin Melanson. Kevin is a longtime Texas Parks and Wildlife game warden and is in charge of our law enforcement recruitment for Texas Parks and Wildlife. Kevin uh, and I have worked quite a bit together. He works uh, hand in hand with a lot of the other recruiters. He's very focused and uh, his focus is increasing diversity within Texas Parks and Wildlife law enforcement. Uh, he works with a number of HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities and HSIs, historically Hispanic uh, serving universities and a lot of youth groups across the state of Texas and beyond. I, I've seen him uh, do his thing out in Florida and in some other places. Kevin is a tireless, tireless speaker and promoter of the value of game wardens in protecting our very precious environment. Welcome to all of you all. And uh, we've had a little time to chat before, but what I, I want you to do is consider three questions and we'll take them in concession, in succession. Uh, what attracted you to nature and the outdoors? What issues have you faced as a person of color in the outdoors? And what would you suggest conservation organizations do to become more relevant to the growing diverse population? So I tell you what, let's start with you, Deja. Okay, um, do you want me to start with my story first or answering those three questions? Start with your story and then jump into those three questions. Okay, um, so I, I consider myself an urban ecologist and science communicator. Um, I'm a recent graduate of North Carolina State University um, from their master's program. And my conservation story um, and my relationship with the outdoors starts um, on the east side of Chicago. And like most kids who grew up in a big city, I was exposed to wildlife through zoos and aquariums and of course through Animal Planet. And so I didn't grow up exploring the outdoors because there was no outdoors to explore. Uh, I was not allowed outside and I wasn't allowed to ride. I was, I was not allowed outside alone and I wasn't um, allowed to ride my back bike past the fourth uh, neighbor's house on either side of us. And um, so I could go to our neighborhood park with my mom, but that park consisted of a playground, tennis courts, and a football um, slash ba a baseball field. And so my first interactions with parks and the outdoors was through sports. Um, I lived in a household with parents who didn't enjoy being outside, um, but my mom indulged my interest in animals by taking me to the zoo and aquarium seven times a year, uh, several times a year. And um, these are the spaces where I first learned about conservation and where my love for animals blossom. And so when I was in high school, my mom became a Girl Scout leader, and this allowed me to travel to different places. But I was upset because I was spending my weekends crafting and doing food drives and clothes drives, but I wanted to be outside learning how to make a fire and learning about hiking and just being outside and learning about the outdoors like Boy Scouts. And so I begged and pleaded my mom to convince the woman in charge to take us camping. And we went camping once, went on a hike, we had s'mores, and it was a trip that I really enjoyed, but um, a lot of other girls there didn't. And so there were tons um, of bugs there and there was really no one in the group who was nature savvy and who could point out things on the trail or let us know that we didn't have wolves in the suburbs of Chicago and that we wouldn't be attacked in our sleep. And it wasn't until the later half of my high school experience that I got a chance to participate in activities related to nature and conservation. I found programs at the Shedd Aquarium that taught me about marine biology and environmental stewardship, but I needed a scholarship to participate in all of those programs because of the cost. Um, and it was through those programs that I started learning about invasive species, learning how to canoe, and had my first experience um, with deer. And I remember this experience, um, it sticks out in my mind so much because it was um, an assignment where we had to sit out um, in the forest preserve and sit still for 15 minutes and draw or write down what we saw and how it made us feel. And through this stillness, I remember watching the leaves starting to turn orange and yellow and having a few falling down around me. And I remember the sun shining through the canopy 
and all of a sudden hearing branches crack and starting to hear something loud moving through the forest. Now, this was my first time being alone in the outdoors. Remember, I wasn't allowed to, you know, ride my back, bike past the fourth house on the block. I wasn't allowed to be outside alone and to be outside alone and in the forest by myself uh, with no other people in sight. I had no idea what could possibly be coming towards me. Was it a coyote? Was it a fox? Was it a person? Um, and I kept thinking to myself, please let it be a fox. And um, but all of a sudden, a herd of deer appeared in front of me, casually walking through the woods, and I watched them in awe for uh, less than two minutes before they would sprint away because they saw me. But this is my first memory of being outside and being um, alone, and it's a it's a memory that I'll never forget. It wasn't until my senior year of high school that I found a free program called Fishing Buddies. And they had a summer youth conservation corps program where participants got paid at the end of the summer for attending classes and complete, completing the projects. Now, this is my first time applying for an internship program and I was nervous that I wouldn't get in because I didn't know much about nature and conservation, I only knew about animals at the zoo. Um, but I was lucky that I was accepted into the program and it completely changed my life. Uh, the Fishing Buddies YCC program was my first exposure to federal and state agencies that managed our natural resources in the city. I didn't even know that parks and preserves um, like the ones we would, would visit were existing in the city. Um, I had no idea that I could be a biologist who tracked turtles or surveyed the lake by electrofishing and monitoring fish populations. I didn't know the importance of water quality and um, how people impact wildlife in cities through things like salting the roads in the winter. I didn't know that agencies like U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or USDA APHIS existed. Um, and this Fishing Buddies program was the only program that I had ever seen that was not only free, um, but it also paid you if you made it to the end of the program successfully. Um, and so this program was fun and provided me with a ton of exposure, but I was able to save my money from the program to use during my first semester of undergrad, um, which during college, I actually uh, majored in animal science because all that time I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian and it wasn't until the Fish and Buddies program that I even knew about natural resources. Um, and so after that first summer, I went down to Tuskegee University in Tuskegee, Alabama and started in that animal science program. But I wasn't happy with learning about domestic animal ag. And I wanted to learn about what existed in the forest and what existed in the ocean. And after my first year, I switched to a natural resource program with a three plus one track, which allowed me to spend a year studying wildlife. And it was a much better fit because I was studying dendrology and silver culture, learning about environmental assessments and policies. And I knew that once I transferred schools, I would get to the stuff that I really wanted to learn about, like ornithology and mammalogy and human wildlife conflict. And so um, I knew that I had a lot of catching up to do because not only did I switch my major, um, but I didn't grow up doing those things that my professors would describe doing while they were growing up. And so every summer I knew I had to do something to give me experience, but I also had to do something that made money that I could use during the following year. I had a scholarship, but I still needed money for if I ever wanted to eat out off campus or hang out with my friends or even put gas in my car since Tuskegee, if you know Tuskegee, is in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and um, after my first summer of undergrad, I went back home and worked with Fishing Buddies, uh, this time as a leader to guide um, students in that same program that I had been in. And my main reasons for wanting to be a leader was selfish. I wanted to experience the things that I had experienced before um, in the following year. Um, but I also learned how to teach kids fishing and archery. And I learned how to fish, uh, how to um, fix broken fishing poles and where to find fish in the water. And so fishing and archery are two activities that I still love to do today. And um, as I continued through these undergraduate program and continued doing these internships year after year, my love for the outdoors grew, grew um, continuously. People never understand how a city girl from Chicago ends up in a conservation career, but I was provided with exposure and I fell in love with the outdoors.
if I didn't get accepted into the paid internship opportunities, I would have never been able to continue pursuing my interest in this field. And it's a constant conflict for many students trying to make it in this field, um, that there are these opportunities that we're interested in um, and that seem like fun, but there were opportunities that I had to pass up because I knew they wouldn't help me, quote unquote, pay the bills. And so I was lucky enough to find internships with the Student Conservation Association, um, with their career discovery internship program which was a 10-week experience and i was placed in minnesota the first time seeing eagles and hawks and owls and seeing herons and sandhill cranes and birds that were bright yellow and bright blue and just woodpeckers of different sizes you know just being exposed to all this wildlife that i had never experienced before and i was in college and um I didn't know that these birds existed. I didn't know that they would even use some place that was 10 minutes from an airport and right across from the Mall of America. And after that summer, I was hooked on birds. And I continued to work with birds throughout my career. But my journey through the outdoors and through conservation was traditional in my mind, in the sense that education opened up a world of opportunities for me. Prior to school, I never knew about these issues, um, which seemed like a whole nother world, um, or at least I feel like people make it seem that way. And once I got to graduate school, I learned about environmental justice. And that's when it all kind of clicked for me, um, equity and access. People who don't have the same exposure to things growing up simply because of where they were born and who they were born to. Um, you could be born in a neighborhood with very little greenery, few trees, no parks, um, no parks with trails close to your house. You could be born in a neighborhood surrounded by industrial plants and have to deal with increased air pollution. You could be born into a place that sits on poor quality land, poor drainage, few trees, and so you're used to flooding and having your things destroyed every time it rains. Or you could be born into a place surrounded by trees and have fond memories of sitting under a shaded tree, memories of exploring the creek in the woods behind your house, having access to parks with trails and ponds and seeing wildlife growing up, having never smelled a landfill or seen factories pumping out gray smoke on your way to softball practice. You could go to school where you have science labs and get to dissect things and do experiments, go to classes where you actually have books that aren't falling apart or even have books that all. And I know what scenario I grew up in. Having a mother who lived in the city and visiting a father who lived in the suburbs, I could see the differences in the landscape um, simply on my drive out to his house. I can see the differences now between what I grew up learning about in school and what my siblings are doing in school. Um, I've seen the differences with my own eyes and I've heard the stories of my peers. I know that everyone deserves access to clean water and clean air. Everyone deserves access to opportunities that will expose them to a variety of outdoor activities and careers. Everyone deserves equal access to spaces to recreate and opportunities to see wildlife. And everyone deserves to go to a school with funds that prioritize science. But that's not the case for everyone in this country, whether you grow up in a rural or an urban environment. And it's not our fault. It's just a matter of where we've been born and the historical structures that set up um, that were set up to ensure that only a select few have access or the time for nice things. And because of this, I use every part of my career to expose people to the outdoors and the nature in their neighborhoods. And that's my conservation story. Um, so with that, I am going to try and tackle those three questions if you want to give them to me again, Mr. Bugs. Okay, the three questions are, and you answered most of it. Uh, the first one is, what drew you to nature in the outdoors? Uh, what issues you faced as a person of color in the outdoors? And what would you suggest conservation organizations do to become more relevant to the growing diverse population? Yeah, so I think I answered um, the first two pretty well already with uh, being exposed to uh, nature and outdoors through a few select um, organizations and um, I guess 
internships and things like that that really exposed me to the outdoors um, when I was in high school and just having the the determination and the passion to keep going. And I think that organizations should do a better job with connecting locally to the communities um, that they're in. And so, um, like I said, I didn't have access to a lot of these programs and opportunities, or I didn't have the knowledge of them. So whether that is going and doing or uh, going and doing programs um, in schools and doing career days or having um, making nature relevant to communities um, to the nature in their neighborhoods. I think a lot of times um, People only get exposed to nature through TV um, or unless they have a family that is very nature oriented. And so they don't really get a chance to understand that we have wildlife here, whether you live in a rural or an urban area, you have wildlife in your neighborhoods, you have nature in your neighborhood that you can go and get exposed to. So I think that increasing programming um, and just really in every aspect of our organizations, making sure that we do something that is giving back to and um, giving back to the community and engaging them with nature and making the organization itself relevant and showing people why uh, these resources are important, connecting them with memories and uh, making it relevant to them. Fantastic. So here's some things that I heard you talk about that I think everybody needs to take heed to. First of all, uh, uh, Deja talked about exposure and not just exposure once you get to college or post-college, but at, in high school, she talked about exposure. She also talked about access to programs, which is extremely important. Making sure there's access, there's ready access, not just creating a program and saying, if we build it, they will come, but actually providing access and going to where the people are. The next thing that I thought was very important, she talked about opportunities. Now, here's the linchpin in that, paid opportunities. Can I say that again? Paid opportunities, very important. And the other thing that I thought was also extremely important was education about the outdoors. Extremely important, educating, starting at that young age and continue to expose those young people to the value of those wild things and wild places. Thank you very much, Deja. That was extremely enlightening. Really appreciate you sharing. Uh, next up, we have Mr. Jason Ward. Jason, take it away. Appreciate it. Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing today? So, just a quick uh, background story into myself. Um, I am a lifelong animal nerd, right? I, I grew up loving animals ever since I could pick up and read a book. Uh, animals were, were my books of choice. Um, this fascination started around five, maybe six years old. And uh, each day after school, I would visit my um, local library and I would pile a desk full of animal books. Um, my fascination started with dinosaurs, but when it came to me actually being able to go outside and study them and would observe them, I was about 66 million years too late. So instead of uh, being able, or at least I thought, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, so instead of me putting a lot of my focus into just dinosaurs, I then turned that to pretty much anything that, that crawled, flam, flew, uh, swam, ran. It didn't matter to me. If it was an insect, if it was a marine mammal, or of course birds, I was into it. Birds wound up becoming the favorites for me for multiple reasons. One, first and foremost, they are modern day dinosaurs. Uh, they have been around for over a hundred million years. They are the closest thing that we have today to those dinosaurs that I loved as a kid. Secondly, the ability to fly. Uh, it, you know, people often ask if you had one kind of superpower, what would it be? I don't even have to think twice about it. It is the ability to fly. Uh, this resonated with me for more than one reason. One, flying is fun. Who wouldn't like to just take off into the air and fly around for a couple of hours, right? Two, birds had this ability to be able to leave a, a less than desirable situation and search for greener pastures. So if they were 
uh, in an environment that was less than suitable for their needs, they could just fly to a better one. I grew up in the South Bronx in the poorest congressional district in the country. There were a lot of times growing up where I wish I had that ability to be able to fly, pick up and leave and find greener pastures, but I couldn't. So I lived vicariously through the birds at a young age. So through grade school, through grade school and junior high school, I was always just that, that kid who knew a lot about animals, that, that kid who the friend, his friends would run to whenever they had a debate to settle or whenever they wanted to hear a fun and interesting animal fact, right? And this persisted into high school as well. So let's fast forward 10 years to when I was about a sophomore in high school. And I had a kind of a spark moment, an aha moment. Uh, I was just hanging out one day and through my window, I was able to see several feathers just kind of just floating by my window one at a time. And me being the nosy New Yorker that I was and still am at the time, uh, I ran to the window to see what was going on. And I was greeted with the sight of peregrine falcon defeathering, plucking the feathers off of a pigeon about 30 feet from me. Now, to most people, this is cause to run in horror and, and, and scream and go the opposite direction. But for me, this was National Geographic in HD. This was Animal Planet. This was Discovery Channel brought to life. And I was hooked. I wanted to watch it. I wanted to learn more about it. Uh, and that was my spark bird moment. Quickly, I, I did a little research on the bird and I found that this bird was indeed a peregrine falcon, fastest animal on the planet. It's a bird that can be found on six of the seven continents. Uh, in fact, its scientific name translates to Falco peregrinus, which is wandering falcon. It's a bird that has the ability to wander. It's boundaryless. So immediately, for those reasons, it became my favorite animal. Uh, this was a special moment in more ways than one. It, it, first, it showed me that no matter where I was, I could enjoy and appreciate nature. I didn't have to travel somewhere far and exotic to be able to appreciate wildlife. Uh, and two, it showed me that no matter what I was dealing with at any given point in time, birds and nature in general had the ability to temporarily bring me out of that space and uh, had the ability to make me smile. I say that because that window that I was observing this peregrine falcon interaction happening was the window of a homeless shelter that my family and I had lived in for about five years. So even though that was a dark time, this interaction with this bird had the ability to make me forget all of these stresses and all of the, the, the negative parts about that point in life. Now, you would think that right after that, I just became birder number one and I just took it full steam ahead, but life kind of gets in the way of things and, and I had to just put that interaction that moment in my back pocket and save it for a, a, a different point in time. So let's fast forward one more time to 10 more years. Now I'm about 26 years old and I'm working at a mortgage corporation here in Atlanta. And I got a promotion and that promotion granted me with two things. It granted me with a little bit more money in my pocket. So some financial flexibility. And it also granted me with time flexibility. I had free weekends and more time to myself. So I took those two things and combined them and I wanted to pursue something that I loved. First thing that popped into my head was sports, but eh, I was 26, I was a little older and slower than I once was back in the high school glory days. It wasn't gonna be sports for me. Uh, wildlife, birds, it was like an aha moment for me. And I Googled local wildlife organizations in the Atlanta area. I quickly found Atlanta Audubon saw that they had a calendar full of field trips that anyone could join and attend for free. All you need to do is show up and have a pair of binoculars. So I took that challenge and I showed up one day at a, at a bird walk and I thought I would be this young hotshot who knew everything about birds, but I was humbled very, very quickly. Uh, these people knew so much and their expertise was amazing and I wanted to be able to do what they did. So eight months later, um, I, I studied, I studied and I downloaded apps and I shadowed birders in the field. And eight months later, I was leading that exact same bird walk. And I have been leading that exact same bird walk every single month since then, since January of 2014 here in Atlanta. Um, since that moment, 
birds have become an increasing part of my everyday life, uh, including social media. I started to tweet and Instagram and Facebook about birds more often than usual. And um, I started to create games that help people uh, identify birds in the field. And people really started to enjoy it. So I, I made sure that I you know, was, was a little bit more consistent with things because one, people were enjoying it. And two, you never know who's paying attention. You never know who's watching. Sure enough, uh, the editorial director of a visual storytelling website called Topic was watching. And she DM'd me, she direct messaged me and wanted to work with me in some kind of capacity. So we brainstormed for a little bit on a conference call a couple of days later. And we came up with this concept of shooting just a couple of videos that would show birding in a fresh new light. Uh, that turned into 20 episodes of what is now Birds of North America, which is me literally being able to live out a childhood dream of mine of you know, being able to walk around the Bronx Zoo with my parents and my little brothers and pop quizzing them on all of the animals in the enclosures and sharing animal facts with them and any kind of stranger who was in earshot. I'm able to do that now for a wider audience. And, and it is um, special in more ways than one. Of course, you have the whole childhood dream aspect of it, but you also have what could come down the line from future generations of conservationists growing up in neighborhoods that I grew up in who don't see images of themselves on Animal Planet, on Discovery, on National Geographic. So they may think that a career in wildlife biology isn't for them. It's not a cool thing to do. Well, we're starting to change that. We're starting to change that narrative and we're starting to have those kinds of conversations and um let's fast forward to this past june um we were able to take that to to another level after the incident in central park with fellow with fellow birder and friend christian cooper another black birder uh, a group of talented incredible individuals were able to get together and uh form black birders week uh, which was a celebration of black people in, in nature and black people uh, who are birders. And it blew up way larger than we ever expected it to. And now we're starting to see on a national level, a lot of these conversations start to happen when it comes to black people in outdoor spaces. So that is uh, my conservation story. Now I have the, uh, the questions that I will get to as well. So as far as what drew me to nature and the outdoors, um, it was a natural curiosity that I had as a kid. Um, and, and I was fortunate enough not to have that curiosity kind of, you know, stomped on or, or suppressed by my parents. Um, I think a major part of that was me realizing that it was different for me to have a love and fascination for the outdoors because none of my friends had that. Um, you know, they, they wanted to, to play sports and that was the cool thing to them was to be able to play sports or do music. So if I ran up to a group of my friends and shared animal facts with them, they would laugh at me essentially. So it was, it was something that I kept secret and it's something that I kept, uh, to my, my younger siblings and my parents. Um, so it was just a natural curiosity that, that, that brought me to that at a young age. Um, as far as challenging challenges that I face as, as a black person in the outdoors, you know, it's especially highlighting the incident that happened this, this past spring with Christian Cooper in Central Park. We are able to see that black bodies are usually weaponized against us. And uh, when we find ourselves in these wild spaces, in, in, in green spaces, in parks, in nature preserves, uh, people often wonder what in the world we're doing there. And, and I think that that, that, that question, I, I have had, some interesting looks from folks uh, who, are, who are wondering what I'm doing in their neighborhood with a pair of binoculars. So those simple challenges of, you know, making sure that I'm looking into a tree with a pair of binoculars, even though there may not be a bird there, but if I'm doing the act of looking into a tree, that signifies or it should signify to the people in the area that I'm here to look at wildlife and to look at birds. So those kind of challenges, that extra thought process that I have to put myself through in order to keep myself safe are, is, is the, the, the challenge that immediately comes to mind. 
when it comes to my relationship with the outdoors. And as far as things that organizations can do to better serve uh, communities of color, I think that, again, to echo uh, the sentiment that we've heard so far, it's not enough to open your doors and to say that we have programming that is available and open to everyone. You have to be consistent. You have to be intentional with your outreach. Uh, and if you find that even though you're being intentional, even though you're being consistent, there's still a language barrier. I will say this, I understand that, but there's an easy solution to that language barrier. You hire people from those communities to be able to do that work. Whenever I go into communities uh, of color and, and I'm able to talk to them about my love for, for nature and my love for, for birds, you can see, you can visibly see their guards drop because I resemble someone that, that they're familiar with. I can be their cousin. I can be their, their brother or their uncle. And you see their guards drop, their defenses lower, and they're more open and receptive to having open and honest conversations. So I think those are some things that organizations can do to kind of further that narrative there, to further that conversation. All right. Thank you, Jason. That was uh, fantastic. So if you were listening carefully, there are some things that I picked up from Jason. First of all, he talked about his love for animals from a very young age. But the other thing that he saw that he said that was very important was seeing images of people that look like him, whether it be on ads, advertisements, on TV or documentaries, that also uh, was enticing to them. The other thing was uh, he talked about making sure that we as agencies do a better job of showcasing dem different demographics in the outdoors. Uh, I know my organization is starting to work on that uh, very, very heavily. And the other thing he talked about is once we start these different activities, when we say that we want to be more inclusive to these broader audiences, these growing demographics, that we be consistent and intentional with our outreach process. I know sometimes, and I've heard stories about folks that start a process and if it doesn't bring instant results, they stop. But you start other processes that don't bring you instant results and you just evaluate what you need to do differently. So you've gotta be intentional with these programs as well. And the other thing that was very important he talked about was hiring people from those different communities in order to help you do the work in resource communities. That was fantastic. Thank you very much, Jason. And now we're going to move to the, the, the great and powerful, my friend, Mr. Kevin Malonso. Take it away, Kevin. Well, David, thank you. I appreciate uh, giving me the floor here. Um, my story starts in uh, the urban setting of, of Houston, Houston, Texas. And often I hear people refer to the big city as the concrete jungle. Um, However, the area of Houston I grew up in, Northwest Houston, a community known as Acres Homes, um, had large tracts of land, you know, still, and, and there's still some left to this day, but being developed um, into some small estates, you know, with uh, some pretty big homes on, in that area now. Uh, but, but just behind the fence of my neighborhood and my home, there was a pretty large uh, uh, setting of, of woods and, and with some ponds and things like that in, in, in that area. So I was able to uh, enjoy as a child going back there and, and playing in the woods and appreciate nature from that standpoint. Uh, small game, a lot of small game animals, uh, migratory birds uh, in the area, even deer would, uh, would, would come into the area every now and then uh, we might see a deer. Um, but my, you know, the, the irony of, of, of my childhood, uh, my first true experience that I remember um, being affiliated with an, an outdoor recreational activity was tied to one of our uh, Texas state parks, Huntsville State Park. And uh, annually, our family would have a gathering at that park, and I was probably four or five years old. And, and I remember, uh, you know, giving a poll uh, with my dad and, and, and catching perch, you know, teaching me how to catch perch. And I, you know, and that was, you know, something that occupied my time over there. Lo and behold, I filled a cooler up pretty much with, uh, with, uh, with perch. And uh, getting home that evening, later that evening, uh, you know, realizing what I'd done, mom was like, well, we're going to clean some fish and have a fish fry. So dad was the one that instructed me on how to catch the fish. And, and mom was instrumental in, in teaching me how to clean the fish. And so uh, I think that's pretty interesting. And uh, as, a, as, a, as a tie to my career today, you know, uh, and my, my appreciation, true appreciation for, 
outdoor recreational activities and fishing, you know, being tied to a state, a state park. And so uh, moving forward beyond that, I had a cousin um, that had a genuine interest in bird hunting, which I would take part in that activity with him, uh, migratory bird hunting for doves. And uh, so I grew up hunting for doves as a child and, and had no idea uh, what a game warden was or, or, you know, anything about the career path of, of being in law enforcement, conservation law enforcement. And so uh, my cousin and I, we would take part in that activity uh, annually during that, that fall migration and, and have a great time. And, and unlike a lot of my colleagues, you know, there's a lot of folks out there that, that had that knowledge base of, of being a conservation law enforcement officer and, and having that passion since they were small children. You know, I wasn't one of those folks. And so Later on, into, uh, uh, I decided to attend a, a magnet school in Houston known as the High School for Law Enforcement and Criminal Justice. And I had that interest in, in possibly becoming a law enforcement officer one day. And, and I have an older sibling that's a law enforcement officer. So that was an attraction as well. And uh, in attending that high school, I, I was also in you know, the ROTC program, Army ROTC program. And so uh, that led me to some ambitions to serve my country. And, and during my high school years, uh, uh, the Gulf War broke out, and uh, upon graduation, I decided to, to serve during a time of war in the United States Navy. And so um, I was fortunate enough that the war didn't last very long, and I did not get deployed to war, but I did serve. And one of my uh, duty stations was in the Aleutian Islands of Alaska, and amazing, amazing opportunity. And so uh, I really gained a greater appreciation for wildlife and the outdoors uh, being stationed in, in a setting like that. So uh, that was Adak, Alaska, the island that I was stationed on and uh, for a couple of years. So I, I really gained a greater appreciation for saltwater fishing, fishing in the Bering Sea and, and freshwater fishing in that, in that setting uh, for salmon and things like that and, and some of the different species they have for freshwater. And so little did I know I was being educated and, and gaining this greater appreciation that would one day lead to me uh, pursuing an occupation in that, in that role. Um, and so being out there in the Aleutian Islands, you know, opportunity to hunt caribou, I was not successful, um, but I had the opportunity to hunt caribou. Um, and waterfowl hunting, you know, I gained an appreciation for waterfowl hunting uh, in that setting. After coming home, after serving my time, I uh, attended Lamar University in, in Beaumont, Texas, and I was majoring in engineering. And I'll be honest, I was looking at a career opportunity where I could make some, some good money, so to speak. And uh, in my career exploration, you know, and, and looking at different opportunities, um, I was out duck hunting with a good friend of mine that I'd served in the military with. Uh, we would, you know, pack the, pack the bags during the winter break and, and he just happened to have a, a beach cabin in the Matagorda County area. And so we would duck hunt during the Christmas break and I had very positive interactions with Texas game wardens in that area. And one in particular, I had multiple interactions with and, uh, and in our communications uh, being checked uh, or him conducting his inspections, you know, he asked me, he said, uh, he said, you're in college, you're a military veteran. Have you ever thought about becoming a Texas game warden? And I said, you know, I, I'm intrigued by what you do and I really don't know a whole lot about it. And uh, I understand some components of it. And, and he gave me some additional information to pursue an internship opportunity. And so I explored that opportunity and, and lo and behold, I was, I was selected, you know, as, a, as an intern my sophomore year of college. And that was a paid internship opportunity. And, uh, and some of those are far and few between, but, but it was of great value, you know, beyond the pay, uh, the experience. So after I experienced that internship, that internship was an eye opener. I had no idea of the value of that career opportunity until I took part in that internship. And, and those game wardens served as great mentors that I worked with in that area. And, uh, and, and it was literally a hands-on experience where you could gain some true insight as to whether or not this is something you might be interested in. And, and, and fortunately, that, that, it, that program still continues today, and I've had the, uh, the privilege to, to be a part of helping to manage that program, um, ironically. And so uh, I guess it was about my junior year, you know, I started to really think about this and looking at the requirements to become a Texas Game Warden. I realized I would have to change my major because it was degree specific at that time. And so that was a hard decision because I'd invested a couple of years towards an engineering degree and to have to make that change, I knew I might have to, you know, stay a semester or two longer to, to get some of those classes in. So I made that decision and uh, I changed my major, you know, to criminal justice. That was one of the options. And, uh, and upon uh, my senior year of uh, college, there was an application process 
I put in for that application opportunity and, uh, and I was selected. And so upon graduation, uh, that, that following summer, May uh, of 2000, um, I entered the Game Warden Training Center. And seven months later, I completed that training and was a full-fledged Texas Game Warden. And uh, I was stationed uh, in the Jefferson County area. Um, and that area encompassed a lot of different opportunities to experience the majority of what we do as Texas Game Warden, saltwater, freshwater, um, many types of big game hunting, you know, when it comes to deer and waterfowl and, and other migratory, you know, bird hunting opportunities. And so, uh, and the commercial seafood industry um, is huge in that area as well. So upon, you know, uh, taking assignment in that area and, and, and fulfilling that, that dream, you know, and I'll never forget, you know, being out there on patrol in those areas. And that was uh, 20 years ago, believe it or not. I, I just uh, secured 20 years of service with the state. So it's been a great and rewarding career. And uh, time has flown because it's been that it's been enjoyable and uh, rewarding in the same breath. But working in that area, you know, it was, you know, 2001 when I when I hit the field. And it was a shocker to me, you know, upon doing inspections and checking people for compliance, you know, some of the reactions I would get. And some of those reactions were, you know, and that was from black community and white community alike. Um, wow, are you really a Texas game warden? And that was a shocker to me that we were in a new millennium and, and people could not believe that I was a Texas game warden. And, and from a standpoint of from the black community standpoint, you know, I, I had several, you know, many, many opportunities to, to have conversations with folks from the community where, you know, they, they, they said they'd never seen a black Texas game warden and, and, and were surprised and, and also appreciative in the same respect. And, and, and I've had folks when I've pulled up in the truck and in the uniform, you know, make the comments, are, are you really a Texas game warden? And, and to my surprise, you know, and, and, and I would answer the question, yes, I'm a Texas game warden. I'm here. And I explained to him while I was there to conduct an inspection, but um, not to say it wasn't without challenges, you know, um, working in an area, you know, that was considered Southeast or further Southeast Texas from the Houston area, but, but a semi-rural setting. Some of those areas are pretty rural and some of those areas are, are urban, but a good mix, you know, of, 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 of terrain and, and, and opportunities to do some different things as a game warden. Um, I, I took it upon myself, you know, to, to understand and have a greater appreciation for the opportunity that I had to share my experiences with others. It was not uncommon for family and friends alike not to truly understand my job and, and what I did for a living. I mean, it was a lot of mis, misconceptions about the job of a Texas game warden. So I would seize those moments, you know, to explain to folks that we were state law enforcement officers and, and what our charge or our task was in, in conservation, along with, you know, being a peace officer and, and someone following into some of those traditional law enforcement roles out there. And, 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 and it was surprised a lot of folks, even to this day. Um, and, and fortunately we've had uh, the opportunity to, to host a TV show known as Lone Star Law that has really put us on the map on Animal Planet where, where people around the world can see us in action and, and have a greater understanding or appreciation for the job that we do as, as Texas Game Wardens. But uh, one way that I saw I could make a difference in changing those mindsets is to to definitely be a part of uh, educating, you know, urban, you know, youth in urban settings and educating uh, folks in, in diverse audiences, such as the university settings, HBCUs, historic black colleges and universities or Hispanic serving institutions and, and targeting, you know, communities and, and areas, you know, to, to really uh, you spread the, the knowledge and, 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 the, and the value of being a Texas game or, or, or looking at conservation oriented careers. And, and, and in my message, it's always, hey, it's, it's, you know, I'm promoting game warden, but also the other additional opportunities to maybe be a wildlife biologist or coastal fisheries biologist, for example. But I've always seized those moments and, and, and ways to strategically do that um, is to engage, you know, the kids. You plant the seeds early and then those seeds get cultivated, you know, through, you know, experiences with us, seeing folks in the uniform that look like them. And so that they can have a greater appreciation, they can hopefully see that reflection in themselves one day. And explaining to them the value of career opportunities, you know, as a Texas game warden. Traditionally, um, I've seen, you know, and, and, and had conversations with parents where well, they don't know anything about these opportunities and they perceive it, you know, sometimes in a negative way as, as not being of status or not paying the wages or the salary that they would like to see their, 
their child make one day, you know, and pursuing all of their education. And so explaining to them the value and showing them the value and, and, and letting them see what those opportunities look like as I feel it changes a lot of perceptions, you know, and, and again, planting those seeds as early as possible. You know, when I've had the opportunity to, to recruit in, in, in those different settings and, and folks that would, had no idea, you know, I can think of a couple of gentlemen that, you know, right now that they had really no idea of what this career opportunity afforded. And, and just having that introductory conversation and explaining to them the opportunities and, 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 and introducing them to internship opportunities and some of them securing those internship opportunities have led to, you know, experiences and even greater experiences than my own. And so those are some of the challenges and, and, and some of the strategic ways to counter, you know, that, that misconception or that lack of knowledge about this being a viable career, just as any other would be such as an engineer or an accountant or, or any other, you know, career path. And if I, any other questions that I, that I may be able to touch back on that I may have missed in my explanation there, David? No, you did great. And I'll just share some of the things that you talked about again. Just like Deja, you talked about being exposed to uh, nature at a young age. Another thing you talked about, and again, everybody hear this, paid internships. Say it again, paid internships. Uh, education in, in urban settings, making sure that we're educating our urban audiences, being intentional about educating our urban audiences visiting some of your HBCUs and your HSIs and some of your uh, Native American uh, non-tribal institutes. And they're all over the U.S. I don't think there's a state in the U.S. that doesn't have one of those types of institutes. And one of the things we've got to understand, and somebody said it yesterday, most of these institutions are land-grant institutions, so their focus is on environmental science. So there's really no excuse for us saying, you know, we can't find them. They're all over the place. You just have to go to them. Uh, and the other thing that Kevin talked about is sharing opportunities and values of conservation careers. And I think that's very important also for our young people to know that there is value in these conservation careers, not just to yourself, but also to the community. So thank you, Kevin. Uh, thank you, Deja. Thank you, Jason, for all the things that you all have shared. Now, here's what we're going to do right now. We're going to take a few questions. Uh, Jen, you're going to probably have to help me with this. We're going to take as many questions as we can. We have a short period of time, probably about another uh, 10 to 12 minutes. But if there are some questions out there, uh, and if someone, uh, Jen, I'm picking on you again. No problem. Um, we do have one question um, to Jason. Um, how many birds are on your life list? <laughs> oh, you're muted. I'm sorry, Jason. Sorry about that. Got it. Um, yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> how many birds are on my life list currently? 447. Awesome. I didn't know there were that many birds in the world. 10,000. <laughs> there are 10,000 species in the world. Wow. wow. All right. Anyone else? And we have some other questions that I, I, I took from a couple of people before. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Questions? Yeah, David. This is John Davis. Hold on, let me get my... All right, well, I can't apparently get my video going here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, so I just wanted to ask, uh, I know uh, Deja and I have talked a little privately in the chat here, but is, uh, is David, I mean, uh, uh, Jason and Deja, are they looking for jobs currently or are they happy where they are? Uh, I am always open to new opportunities. Um, I'll say that. <laughs> yeah, so I am, um, I recently graduated this summer with my master. So I am currently um, on the job market looking, um, currently residing in Raleigh, North Carolina, but I'm also open to relocating. Now, what are you going to do about that now that you put that out there? Now, now. But thank you. Thank you for that question. Anybody else? I have a question. This is Jen. Um, so 
I am interested in when you go to the outdoors, whether it be a state park or, you know, you're bird watching in a neighborhood, what makes you feel comfortable in that space? And maybe conversely, what makes you feel uncomfortable? That's for any one of you all. Um, so things that make me feel comfortable, uh, immediately I go to being in groups of familiar faces. Uh, I think that any time that I get to, you know, go birding or go hiking with, uh, with friends or people that I'm familiar with, that automatically uh, makes me feel comfortable. But um, things that make me feel uncomfortable are, you know, visiting new locations uh, solo. That, that is always a, it could be a precarious situation. You know, there's a lot that, that is unknown. I think that to a certain extent, um, women who hike by themselves, women who enjoy the outdoors by themselves, they also have that in the back of their mind as well, right? Like this may be a, a, an unsafe environment for, you know, me when, if I'm by myself without any protection, right? So those kind of things, um, I would say, ring true for me as well. I would agree with that um, sentiment. Being a black woman who likes to enjoy the outdoors, um, go hiking, go birding. Um, sometimes I'm hesitant to explore new places that I haven't been to. Um, I'm typically alone. And so um, in areas where I can, sometimes I, I bring a dog in areas um, where I can't, um, I guess I'm just out of luck. And um, I think for me, what makes me feel comfortable is seeing a smiling face um, sometimes um, when going outside. I know it's not, you know, something that you can force people to do, but um, sometimes when I'm outside exploring or bird watching, I get a lot of stares and that can make me feel uncomfortable because as uh, being black and being a woman, it, it makes me think, why are you staring um, at me so intently? Um, and just thinking about what's on someone else's mind. Um, yeah, um, it would. it's nice to see familiar faces on the trail. It's nice to see people who look like me out on the trail. Um, and that's really all I can think of at the moment. For me, um, uh, things that would, I guess I can think of an opportunity where it's an uncomfortable setting is, is sometimes the perception, and I've, I've been asked this by, by many people over the years, you know, are you afraid, you know, when you're out there, you know, as a, as a Texas game warden at night, you know, alone and by yourself? And, and for me, uh, growing up in the outdoors and, and with that wooded terrain, you know, just behind my home, I, I felt like that was my happy place, so to speak, you know, being outdoors and being in those settings. And, and, and I attribute the training that we have, we, we have probably some of the greatest training in, in the country as far as law enforcement is concerned. And, and uh, you know, with the, the training that we have and, and the experience and the mentoring that, that we have uh, amongst my colleagues, you know, it's, it has served to really be a, a benefit in that and, and feeling more secure in those environments, the way we train and the, and the way we work, where we understand that environment that we work in. And, uh, the great, one of the great rewards for me is, is, is being able to, to interact with youth, you know, in my job. And, and that's whether it be out there, you know, checking the family that's taking part in one of the outdoor recreational activities, whether it be boating or fishing or hunting and, and to see that glow in a child's eye. And, and I've had many times, you know, little children run up and, and wrap their arms around my leg, you know, as if I was a family member or a friend or relative. And, and, you know, and you kind of look at the parents in that way and you're like, whoa, what's just, what's really going on? But, but those moments, you know, are, are, are moments where, you know, you're proud, you know, to be a Texas game warden. All right. There are a few questions out here. We'll try to get to a, at least a couple of them. Hold on a second. All right, uh, one question is for Kevin. What was your initial experience among your fellow game wardens? Was the organizational culture accepting of you? Uh, my, 
I, ironically, um, the game wardens that I initially served with, I, I served as a as an intern, you know, with those gentlemen, and uh, they served as as mentors. You know, uh, you know, they exposed me to a lot of the different aspects of the job, and and I got to work with them in many different capacities, whether it was working, you know, you know water safety primarily during the summer, but some of the commercial seafood uh, enforcement. So it was the beginning of my 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 training to become a Texas game warden, literally. And upon completing the Game Warden Training Center and being stationed back in the same area, um, I had the opportunity to work with those same gentlemen as a, as a true colleague in Texas Game Warden. And, and again, I had those same experiences where it was, you know, positive and well received, but it was more of an, uh, an independent status, you know, just for the sheer nature of how we work. You know, we would partner up as much as we could. But, you know, and, and they were a resource I could call on and, and ask for assistance or or thoughts when I needed that assistance or that expert opinion on, on different things that I may have been dealing with. But ultimately the way we're structured, you know, it's, it's a mentoring role. And so I was fortunate enough to have, you know, some guys and out there to really help guide me and lead me you know, in the field. Thank you for that. Now, this is a question for all of the panel. It says, please provide a few examples, how federal state agencies and universities, can foster diversity and inclusion and equity opportunities in a virtual workplace. Who wants to take that on? I would say when it comes to um, virtual opportunities, we have to be intentional, intentional about who we're engaging with and um, going the extra mile to get the word out to the groups that we want to engage with our workshops or webinars or whatever virtual opportunity that we're looking at. Um, I think that this whole pandemic has provided um, an opportunity for us to connect and get our messages out to a lot more people than we normally would because we are online and um, a lot of people do have access. It'll uh, have recordings you know, allow people to view these things at a different time schedule. You don't have to rush and be at a physical place. So I think it allows us to engage with a lot more people than we would if we were having in-person meetings. And so just being more intentional about who you are sending out the announcement to for your opportunities and um, who you're sending your, your announcements out to and um, just being, I would say do your research on um, what organizations you might want to reach out to. They're out there. Um, you just have to do the legwork. Anybody else want to address that one? I'll say from a, from a law enforcement standpoint, it's tough um, because the value is truly in the hands-on experience with us. And uh, I had to ponder on this idea um, as we, you know, rolled out our intern, our summer internship uh, program and, and the possibilities of things being shut down uh, with COVID-19. And 